guys, so if you're new here, or if you're not, if you want to hear me voice act, head over to our main channel, links down below. And if you don't, this channel's solely for TTS. Um, if you want to know all the details about what's going on, we have a stream up that you can go and watch, but let's just get on with the video. So this is another story from the Paladin DM that also goes by Lord Althory. If you like his work you should check out his subscribe star to support him directly or check out his YouTube channel linked to down below. And with that out of the way let's get into the story. As the War Master took flight, wings gleaming golden as the sun set, he sent forth two signals. The primary signal was to the army on the beaches, and here the Smalfo skirmishes and the Dragonborn shock troops reform. The Black Lions redoubled their engagements to finish off the last of the eight demons, and the second and third lines of the Halbodiers began to fall back a few paces. The secondary signal was to his reserves. The time had come to counter-attack and bring this battle to a closing. His plan had worked exactly as intended. Elaktum had deployed his line breakers all across the formation to put pressure on the whole line at once and thus prevent the paladins from being able to address all the issues at once. It would have worked too, if not for the Black Lions and Dragonborn Assault Corps. These new additions to the army had been enough to counter the demonic attack and at the same time completely remove the enemy's Nkos. How nice of Elaktum to have thrown all his officers directly into their deaths. Such were the problems with the command structure based primarily upon might. Phase 2 could be considered halfway a success so far. He had vastly underestimated just how powerful the demon's magic could be, and it had cost him his best skirmishes. Still, they had done their job and blunted the enemy's flanking maneuver enough for the Black Lions to shatter it completely. Now the only enemy commander remaining besides Elaktum himself was currently wading towards the left flank, which was feigning fatigue, just as they had been ordered. As the great demon closed to engagement distance, Julian's second signal reached Bast, calmly resting on the back of Shetan in the shadow fell. Bast, the conditions have all been cleared. You are go for checkmate. It's time then. The Bob Devil said with a grin to her mount as she signaled the rest of the group. Onwards. Ordo Vault. All hail the War Master. All hail Odania. Ordo Vault. All hail Odania. Came a great cry from the sea, and with it the sound of hooves running on the waves. Charging out of the shadow fell, the Ordanic army's nightmare call came barreling into the enemy's exposed flank and knights of nightmare and fellow men they were indeed. The herd had benefited greatly from their compact with Julian, and now they charged forth, barded and armored. On their backs their riders carried grey swords in place of the usual lances. These were made not merely to break the enemy on the charge, but to use the unique ferocity and resilience of their diabolical steeds to plunge into enemy formations and turn their flanks and back lines into a charnel house. At their head rode Bast to top Shetan, and flanking her were the last three members of the Black Lions, each of which rode an unbarded Morchazian, for no steed could bear them once they activated their enlarged brands. As such, it had been decided that they should ride unarmored ones for maximum speed to deliver them into the enemy formation. There was Trajan of the Alpha Legion, now armed with a mighty spear, Sijin, Farron's sister and shield maiden of the road, and Atar, now armed not with a maul, but a mighty executioner's sword modeled on the one the executioner demon had borne. As one, they leapt from their steeds and brought fury onto the great demon before it had a chance to react, even as their reinforcements butchered their way towards it. Elaktum. Julian roared in challenge, leveling his blade at the creature on the throne. Your horde is mighty, but your tactics are foolhardy and arrogant. Doubtless you dreamt that mortals alone could not stand against you. Mortals they may be, but these are my mortals. They are my chosen people, my bulwark against chaos. By the light of reason, they have been bound together as one, by the might of science, I have granted them new power. They are the nation of order, they are my black lions, 
and the age of chaos and division is over. Order. On. Me. Julian roared with all the fury and zeal of a lion, and he fell like lightning upon the demon prince, the thunder of an army roused the battle in his wake. The dragonborn charged forwards, past their dwarven allies' shield wall with fire licking out from between their jaws. The Ordanic army shielded their eyes, as a wave of fire incinerated the front ranks of the demonic army. As the demons were still regaining their sight, the small folk engaged. The munitions of their slings had been spent, but they still had their short swords. They had effectively no chance against the larger demons in the melee, but the larger demons had almost all already been engaged or destroyed. Now they were a match for the lesser demons, and their diminutive size turned to their advantage. They ran into the enemy formation, slipping under and between the legs of the dretches and then attacking from inside. This would have been suicide normally, leaving them under attack from every angle, they would not last for long, but they had not engaged alone. Nay, they were only there to distract and confound. With the demons entangled with the small folk, they were ill-prepared for when the fresh second and third lines of Halbodiers smashed into their horde, throwing the demons back. Then, just as the first charge began to lose momentum, the Dragonborn came roaring black in to restore the impetus, and their mass and great weapons turned the tide back irreversibly. A rolling series of attacks came in, charge after charge throwing the demons back into the pit. All the while, the small folk rushed in and out, foiling the momentum of any countercharge. Then in the center, the bellow of balls could be heard as the furrowed boar super heavy cavalry arrived, charging out of the ash cloud where they had been hiding, war pig at the front. Kazdor leapt upon his mount and the other paladins followed suit, plunging forwards in a wedge straight into the heart of the demonic infantry. Demons were crushed underfoot by the coming charge, and those that did not were torn to pieces by the paladins and their elite bodyguards. Andri was the most terrible of them all, for her merest presence was anathema to the forces of Loth. Dretches turned to dust just by drawing near to her, and her arrows tore through the formation like lightning bolts. Perhaps Elaktham might have been able to turn back the tide if he personally intervened and unleashed his magics. If nothing else he would have reaped a truly horrific toll upon the Ordanic army, but he wouldn't get that chance. The Warmaster would see to that. The Demon Prince had smirked as the Angel had fallen upon him, thinking that he was going to attack the duplicate he had set up on the throne. But then, at the last moment, Julian had swerved, landing a devastating blow upon the Demon Prince, hurling him and his bodyguards back. Elaktham snarled in confusion, until he saw the Angel's eyes. Detect magic. He hissed in realization as he regained his footing and dropped the illusion covering his halberd. Inquisitor's Polar and Warmaster's Grey Sword clashed with incredible force, both men putting their full might physical and magical into the blow. Julian's smite swirled into the blazing blade and a torrent of hellfire washed over both men on the ground between them, melting the sand to glass below their feet. Checkmate. Julian said with a grin. Eyeball to eyeball with the elate. Not yet. The demon returned with an animalistic growl. Tear him to pieces. He roared, and the demons surrounding them leapt at the arsima. You were woefully predictable. Julian smirked back, as he raised high one boot and brought it down hard into the molten sand. Crimson force fled, and the glass exploded out onto the charging demons, throwing them back and leaving them rolling around on the sand as molten silicate stuck to their flesh, bright as the sun. The blast also pushed Elaktham back though, giving him breathing room to raise up his hand and unleash a spell. Julian raised his own gauntlet and snapped. Blinding light filled the area between the two arcanists as black and crimson lighting met and strove against one another like serpents in the space between. You were a fool to come here, Paladin. Elaktham chastised his opponent as his body began to put itself back together. Your canned magic will run out, 
and your mind is really the only exceptional thing about you. That sort won't be enough to make the difference between a warrior and a hobbyist. Idiot. Julian shot back. My wing condition isn't beating you, it's tying you down. Now fall. He commanded, and Elaytham felt his legs give out under him. He stepped back up in a fraction of a second, but in that moment Julian's lighting slipped under his and hammered the demon prince in the chest with the fury of the storm. Elaytham went sprawling, but came back up in time to parry aside the next two blows from the war master. He flung out a palm towards the Arsimmer's chest, and there was a low throb in the air. Now it was Julian's turn to go flying, the shockwave slipping under his armor and then exploding outwards to pulverize his internal organs with the force of an oncoming train. Julian went sliding back, vomiting up blood. His lungs had been torn apart and were filling with fluid, drowning him in his own blood. His heart had been badly damaged and had lost his left ventricle altogether. His lower torso burned as his ruptured stomach filled his body with acid, and his movements felt sluggish as blood vessels burst all over. Somewhat ironically, the fact that he was so badly damaged saved him, as he was no longer even capable of going into shock. He raised a hand to his chest and fixed what he could. He was still dying, but he was dying slowly enough. Crimson energy covered his limbs. His muscular and skeletal structure was still intact, but with the total collapse of his cardiovascular and respiratory systems, they simply didn't have the oxygen needed to move. So, Wuhan Magic would have to do. Elaytham raised a finger to point at the mortally wounded Arsimar, and necrotic energy poured forth, so thick that it took on physical form as the black vines ripped across the air to strangle Julian. A six-stoned gauntet reached out, and caught the vines out of the air, holding them back. No. The spell was torn away from Elaytham's hands as the War Master vanished, then reappeared in a clap of thunder. Eye of terror bit deeply into the side of the demon's head, the fire scorching it away and pushing forwards. But the wound Julian had sustained slowed him down too much. The spear end of the halberd lashed out and hit Julian's knee, bending it backwards with a sickening crunch. Julian fell, his strike ruined, and the spear end swept up. It tore through the helmet, ripping it off, along with half the skin on Julian's face. It bit deeper still, into the skull, and as it came out the other side it tore out the Azmir's left eye and sent it scattering onto the sands. The force of the blow flung Julian back, and then the axe head of the halberd came down on where the shoulder met the neck, nearly cutting off the right arm altogether and slamming the corpse of the war master into the dirt under a fountain of blood. Elaytham had no time to savor his victory though, for even as he rose from that blow, a silver arrow pierced his shoulder, setting his world on fire. Then a javelin struck him in the chest, and before he could properly gaze upon his foe, a wave of dragon fire washed over him, and all he saw was blue hot fire. Snecket charged in after the blaze, hoofs ringing off of Julian's armor as she slammed her shield into the demon's chest, throwing him back off of the fallen angel. Dawning dreams struck twice, amplified yet further by her faith, and smashed traitors into the demon prince. The war master was dead, but with his last moments he had bought the time his companions would need to close the distance and secure victory. Farron and Peregrine raced to Julian's side, but it was too late. Peregrine closed the Arsimmer's remaining eye, the killer's glint arising like never before. Farron laid a hand on the halfling's shoulder. Throw me. Peregrine ordered, voice cold as ice. Kazdor soared in to assist Senkit, axes at the ready. It was a testament to Elaytham's skill with the halberd that he managed to face each of them and still hold it a stalemate. The dragon and the devil fought like a single entity, each covering each other's defenses and making openings for the other to strike. Then, Kaz spotted something moving in the sand and made a surprising feint, leaving his side open to land a blow on Elaytham's shoulder. The demon grinned, thinking the great dragon to be reckless, and struck, 
only to have his attack fail as his arms mysteriously severed from his body. He ought, concealed under a cloak of greater invisibility, chuckled as he watched a look of confusion replace one of triumph. His amusement did not last long though, as Ilaitham dodged away from Senkit and wailed his halberd above his head. Senenka slipped back, one with a scratch on her shield, the other with a gash in his pauldron. Eort ducked away under his shield, deflecting the blow but falling from the sand. He had not expected that attack, and so his footwork had been poor. But now Elaitum knew where he might be and turned with a series of low swinging strikes. Eort rolled away and leapt back as the halberd swept up the sand where he had been but a moment before. But the sand stuck to him, only for a moment before the spell covered it, but that was all Elaitum needed. He thrust the polearm forwards, forcing Yort to deflect it and be pushed away further from his allies. The demons had recovered from Julian's glass attack and charged back into the fray, holding back Senkit and Gazdor and foiling under his shot. Yort struggled back while Elaitum pressed the attack, his wild wide sweeps simply targeting everywhere at once. Then he heard a shrill cry. A scream of rage, as Peregrine came flying in to drive both his swords into the demon prince's eyes. Elaitum reeled back as dark power ravaged his body, flailing about in the sudden dark. Peregrine twisted his blades, blending Elaitum's head into a pile of goo as he leapt off. Faced with the swords masters of order undivided, Elaitum forsook even the pretense of his form and reverted to his true form. A writhing mass of black and yellow goo, covered all over with eyes of many colors, some of which should not exist and of which there are no words for. With his vision regained, the demon lashed out with its halberd towards Peregrine, excoriating his arm and flinging away one of his swords. Even still, this did not stop the enraged halfling, as he landed and leapt again in a flip one of his bare feet grasping his lost sword's hilt with his toes and bringing it back to his ravaged arm as the halfling landed on the halberd and ran up it, even as he ought tore into the demon from behind. Andre herself fearlessly charged forth into the demon surrounding her and the rest of the order, silver brands flaring. She swept her hand through the air, and with the power of the gods behind her uttered a single word. Begone. The brands of the exorcism fled and a wave of holy silver moonlight rolled off of the elf, turning any demon that touched it to dust as she banished it back into the abyss, obliterating Elaitum's meat shields in a single move. Kazdor and Senkit charged, and paused for a moment when they heard a familiar snap, and saw lightning leap from a six-stoned gauntlet to strike the javelin still sticking out of Elaitum like a lightning rod. Then Farron charged the monster as well, mitral flame in one hand, and the gauntlet of storms upon the other. Elaitum knew there was nothing he could do should the paladins reach him, and so he called to his army. But they did not answer, for the Ordanic army had already thrown it back. As he watched, the other Glabrezio fell under the combined might of the six black lions, and all about him his once mighty horde was being butchered. He turned to flee, but the bow was too long range, he'd never make it in time. He moved towards it, but Gazdor and the rest were already between him and Dundry. So Elaitum fought, and fought with all the savagery of a cornered animal and all the fury and hatred of a demon. The paladins came at him all at once. Gladius, mace, grey sword, less than great sword, axe, shield, and boot. Though all five were against him at once he simply did not die, even as blow after blow of Andre's retribution slammed into him like cannonballs. The ground around them was turned first red, then black as the demon lashed out all around, striking blow upon blow. Gashes were opened, limbs broken, and blood flowed like a river from the paladins as they fought, but still they fought on. They simply refused to die, not taking one step back, or letting up the assault for even a moment. Then, in a last desperate move, Elaitum coiled up on his halberd like a spring and launched himself out of the encirclement, 
essence trailing behind him as his grip on life and the world hung in the balance. Like a rabid dog he charged Andri, mad from the pain and terror, even as first one arrow, and then a second tore through him, leaving massive chunks of his body as nothing but ashes. Then he reached near her aura, and it was like standing before the sun. His ghee flesh melted, then burned away, but he was finally close enough. She raised her bow to fire one more arrow, one more would be all it took to finish him. But with the speed born of desperation and madness, he lashed out, throwing the elf back and tearing the bow from her hands. He lunged forwards to strike again. When something grabbed him from behind. And then a flaming grey sword appeared from his stomach. The demon twisted its head around backwards and screamed in terror, confusion, and sheer undulated rage. For it gazed into the skeletal face of the war master of order undivided. His body was still every bit as mangled as before, a rotting corpse writhing with the invisible energy of unspeakable willpower. The mangled remnants of flesh on his face had burned away, leaving it half a grinning skull. The empty eye socket glowed crimson, blinding and brilliant like a dread ruby or a dark sun. I killed you. Elatum screamed, his watery, wavering voice turned high-pitched by terror. I killed you. How the fuck are you not dead? It would have been a strange confluence of factors that together brought about this dark miracle. The walls between the worlds were thin, and Julian had altogether too much experience getting his body to move when it should have been completely unable to through the power of his will and magic. But most of all perhaps was the answer the undead paladin gave to the demon prince. I am a paladin of order undivided, and even in death, that I remain. The demon raised high his halberd to banish the corpse war master, when an arrow struck it through the head. The halberd fell, and the demon slumped forwards, silver and crimson fire consuming its body. And Elaktham was no more. Its business finished. The revenant departed. The light died from his eyes, and Julian died for the second time that day. He did not hear the cries of victory as the demon army vanished with their leader. He did not hear the calls from the other paladins as they sought Grimbindrel, who had been kept in reserve because he could perform spells of resurrection. Instead he found himself back once again in the shadow fell, an ethereal crimson ghost looking over the remnants of the battlefield. Many other spectres and less Savoy creatures had been drawn to this place, but none dared to bother him. Even in the shadow, the fire of Draken feasting could be seen burning, casting light into the darkened land. He turned towards St. Jonas, towards his capital yet unclaimed. The foe without had been defeated, and in breaking it had defeated the foe within, unifying the people of his land into not merely an alliance, but a nation. Now only the blight remained between him and becoming master of the greatest nation in the north. So, he stared, left eyes still marked with crimson, towards the night walker that sat there in his city, awaiting the Arsimer to come. That fate might play its bloody hand and the end of an age could be ensured. You're next. No tabletop RPG is complete without beautiful models on the table and the best place to get models is from us. If you check the link below we have everything you could need for your magical realm. Only the finest of big titty wafers here. But if you're not into models or don't play with models we got you covered with subclasses such as the Gachimashi Wizards, the Simp Warlock and the North FC Fighter. Also we have started selling 5th edition adventures with our first one featuring Belle Delphine, the succubus that has poisoned the town's well and turned the villagers into simps. If any of that stuff sounds fun to you go ahead and check the link below but let's get back to the video. I am the bard, whose heart is filled to bursting both with mourning for all that is lost, and hope for that which is gained, for nothing is ever given without taking away. And the exchange is so rarely equivalent. The battle was won, the demon prince destroyed, his army banished, and not even the blood of the demons remained to stain the golden beaches, which were therefore painted sanguine with the blood of martyrs alone. Elven and Dwarven, human and hobgoblin, halfling and kobold, 
Goblin and Dragonborn. All alike flowed down into the sea, and was washed away with the tide. Black and red flowed together until it was a singular dark burgundy. Even when the sea had claimed the majority of the Vitae, the sand remained so stained. This Julian looked upon, still leaning upon Andre for support. The Crimson Path. He said calmly, his only company being the elf and the sea. I had thought it a metaphor really, but now, it stands before me. A path towards salvation made by the blood of the worthy. Much as you mock the gods, it would seem they do not mock you in return. Andri said. If they leave a sign such as this, in honor of your conviction. I doubt it. Julian responded characteristically. It is only sand, and the sea makes her presence known. As a Sam castle it will pass away and return to only a metaphor, and all the blood shed to make this sign shall be meaningless. Do not think so, Andre responded. Old I may look, but many centuries lie before me yet. I shall not forget, and even after you all have passed away, I shall remain. The blood shed here will not be in vain. Bold of you to assume you'll outlive me, Julian joked. Though I suppose you already have, he said with a chuckle, looking down at his own translucent hands, which had been cold and stiff but a few hours before. When the cleric had come to his corpse to revive it, I will, and I hope that when your time comes at last you let it be that, and go to your rest. Rest is for heroes, and those whose work is done. If I manage to finish all that I must do in the few decades that remain to this body, I shall rest, however I somehow doubt that. Julian responded grimly. As for those heroes who have gone to their rest, I think they shall deserve a better monument than a beach which shall be bleached gold anew in a few days. And so, in the days to come, the Ordanic Union recovered from their victory. In the course of the battle, 200 had perished a decimation of the army. But considering the circumstances, such low losses were nothing short of miraculous. Those who could be and were willing to be were resurrected, but there were not nearly enough gemstones of sufficient value, and so only a few returned. Even then, the battle had left its effects, even upon the dead who had been raised. None showed this more plainly than Julian. He had lost his eye to elate him, and no magic had been able to restore it. As such, the socket remained empty, but when his wrath was roused, it gleamed with the baleful crimson that had been the last thing the demon prince had ever seen. Other scars were less obvious, and other absences more crippling. Even among those who had not fought, they had borne witness to the most horrible army to have ever walked the earth since ages long forgotten. The soldiers upon the front lines had stood eyeball to eyeball with the horrors of the abyss, and the experience changed them. The dwarves most of all, who had borne the weight of the army, became even more grim and dour from the waves of demons that had broken upon them. The elves suffered the greatest absence, as nearly their entire deployment had been exterminated, and torn apart with such ferocity that one body could not be told from another. But in this time of great sorrow, the scars perhaps made them stronger, the fire forging new connections. The hobgoblins, already veterans of many campaigns and accustomed to the horrors of war, served as council and sturdy walls for the green humans. Around the tables of the veterans, dwarves raised flagons alongside hobgoblins and humans and even elves. As for the elves, they remembered the courage of the kobolds who had fought and died besides them, and the two races drew closely together, for they had suffered terribly on the flank. This kinship would endure for all time, such that the elves of that land would forever call the scaled folk not crevisher, which is a term elves use for goblins, kobolds, and vermin alike. But instead they were called Dilth and Lug, which means little dragons, for their courage was truly that of dragons, and all who heard of it marveled. And so it came to be that the evil of Elatum and the loss of so many was turned out for good, for this is the fundamental law by which all creation turns, for the story is at its end, a comedy, and the author loves his creation, even though it despises him and itself alike.
the Paladins had made the people of the Ordanic Union allies. The threat of Elaitum had made them comrades. But now, the suffering had made them brothers. And no more did they look upon the Paladins and wonder how a devil and angel might treat one another as sister and brother, complete with all the rivalry and bickering that siblings bring upon each other, or how an elf and a hobgoblin might embrace each other with the affection of friends dearer than family. So, it was as one that one week and one day after the battle, the whole of the Union, small as it was, came forth and stood upon the beaches. Already, each had attended to the dead after their own tradition. This was to honor them as one go, and to establish their memory forever. And before them, upon the crimson-stained beaches, far enough that the tide could not reach it, and set upon a stone foundation so that it could not be washed away, a great obelisk was set up. It was like a milestone carved of the obsidian of the mountain, a creation personally of King Kazdor and his finest artisans. Upon it were the names of all those who perished, and also a poem, which when sung became a sort of anthem for the nation. On golden beach neath summer's glow, there stood once fellows never so bold, whose lives were gave, and by them paved, an everlasting and blessed road. Against demon great, they gave it all, they stood as one, lest divided fall. Cast aside hate, and as one stand. The halfling took the goblin's hand, O, oh, spirits noble, judge us now. Lest we break this solemn vow, we march as one, in summer's glow, upon the blessed crimson road. Towards dream you held, onwards we ride, let what blood has bound, none now divide. And so, it was written, and when sung was a solemn hymn of mourning, and a stalwart oath of resolve. Now never claimed the authorship, and in all my searching for this chronicle none will admit to having written it, but by certain similarities to other cultures' songs, I can say it was most likely a collaboration between Senkit, Eort, and Peregrine. After this, there was a long moment of silence, and a flame was lit atop the obelisk, enchanted that it should never go out. Then the song was sung again, and the whole of the congregation sang as one. Then, as the sun set lower and Kazdor stepped forwards to speak, and spoke with unusual eloquence that could only be the result of a great deal of practice with his common. My friends and my brothers, the fallen are honored. For a week and a day we have mourned them, and now at this given them the greatest funeral and honor we can. Now, look from the land of the dead back to the living. See, because of them we are still alive, and more than living, triumphant. The great enemy is dead. Let us not of him corrupt our triumph by giving in to sorrow, for the dead have died for joy, and now rest with the gods in the highest honors, for they were all heroes. Arise my brothers. The time for mourning has come and passed, now, honor the dead by living, and living in the joy of the triumph they have given us. Tonight, we observe the solemn funeral fast, for it is dark, and the darkness makes joy fleeting. Tomorrow though, at dawn we shall begin a great celebration that shall last well until the night, that we might drive it back with the force of our victory. Let tragedy and the past linger only a little while longer. Behold, the future is open to us and infinitely brightened. We owe it to the dead to enjoy that light, as surely as they enjoy the light of heaven. At this, there came a roar of approval, for the flame of his doors open, earnest and honest heart touched each, and though in mourning, the fire of victory roused their eyes, and as one they resolved to cast off the shadow, and in doing so banish the workings of Elaitum forever. As if the gods heard their resolution, the sunrise the next day was one of the most brilliant in many years. I remember it well, and I was far to the south at the time in the court of a certain desert prince. Therefore, if the reports of the brilliant and beautiful sunrise are to be believed, the whole of the earth from the lowest to the highest latitudes was blessed on this day. The day began with a blast of joyful trumpets, and then the clash of cymbals, the beating of tambourines, and all manner of musical instruments together, each in their own method. 
roused the whole of the hold and all within with happy song. And a beautiful, etheric song, one of which every person knew, for songs such as this the foundations of the world are made of, spread throughout the hold. And the song pierced through each and every other, drawing the people down, like a benevolent siren, towards the dining hall. There, assembled at the high table, the paladins sat before many tables spread with the most delightful and extensive breakfast that has ever been seen. Each one was wearing a crown of laurels, and similar crowns were to be found at every place in the hall. And the people assembled her Senkit and Dundry had finished their magnificent duet together, and they sat down. Senkit blessed the meal, and the whole group began to delight in a magnificent breakfast feast. Although, there was one paladin missing from the high table, and he did not emerge, for he was asleep. That was Peregrine, and he caught what nap he could, having been up all night coordinating not only this, but the other two feasts which would take place yet. After the delightful breakfast, the party broke from the gloomy corridors of the hold to the outside, where the sky was blue, the air was warm, and the sun was shining most brightly. Furthermore, the red stains upon the sands had now completely washed away, and the only memory of the battle was the great stone which had been set up. Therefore, upon the beaches golden once again, the people delighted themselves with all sorts of games and enjoyments. They ran along the beaches, built grand citadels from the sand, and swam in the ocean. All this was without fear, for no creature in all the land was foolish enough to get near a gathering with this many dwarves and hobgoblins as hand. In the same man, even the most courageous sharks knew to avoid the seas around the hills of the road, for the dragonborn swam there, and theirs was the mastery of the seas. Imagine then the horror the poor creatures must have felt when they found the formerly safe waters to the north suddenly invaded by quite literally all the dragonborn. Such a sight has rarely been seen as all the sharks and octopi and other predators of the seas fleeing in droves away from the occupied beach, and it was a sight of great amusement. It also came to be that contests of every sort began to spring up across the beaches, and it came to be that the winner of any such contest would take the loser's laurel. This continued for some time, until even the paladins began to compete. Cause Dor faced Farron in an arm wrestling contest, and after a mighty struggle threw his arm into the sand and took his laurel. However, Farron returned the challenge to the king with one of his own people, and the pair dove into the sea to catch a fish with naught but their bare hands. After ten minutes, Kazdor came out dragging a shark behind him that had been stupid enough to mistake the king's crimson for blood. Farron on the other hand emerged with nothing but a single clam. At first all were confused, until Farron forced the creature open and revealed within a pearl of great value, a far more valuable prize than even the largest fish. Kazdor conceded, and returned the laurel. Similarly, Senkit and Eort found themselves in competition, first in a tug of war, which Senkit won easily, and then again in a wrestling match. Senkit was the stronger, but Eort was a legged son, and trained in the ancient arts of wrestling practiced by the Hobgoblin empires, who in turn had learned it from the more cultured but less militant Triton city-states which had preceded them, before that race's arrogance saw the whole of its civilization cast into the deepest oceans, where it remains to this day, still practicing their democracies, which had so inspired Julian. As for the Arsima, he contented himself with quieter pursuits, engaged in a game of chess with Robot until they were found and disturbed. A great crowd soon filled the room, so eager to see the great strategist and his apprentice at work, that it was filled to capacity such that Julian fled out his window. He then hit himself by hanging upside down from the lip of the caldera like a bat. There he continued his game with a similarly inverted Robert and a body supported by a tensor's floating disc. Julian eventually returned from apparently nowhere, this time wearing two laurels. 
There was then a light picnic lunch upon the beaches at around 1 hour afternoon, light partly because everyone's bellies were yet mostly filled from the breakfast, and partly so that it would not spoil the appetite for the feast yet to come that evening. Then, as the sun began to set, the people retired and put on the best garb they had before attending once more to the great hall. That our mighty feast indeed awaited them, and all were clad in the best of their race's own style. Dwarven men and women alike wore simple enough clothing, but adorned it with magnificent jewelry, beautiful rings and necklaces, golden arm braces and silver circlets, that each one was bedecked as a prince. Kazdor was the greatest of these, with crown of ancient kings, rings of every gemstone, and prize of prizes, the magnificent cloak of dragon scale that still rested on his back. Besides him yet not on his arm came Senkit, clad not in gaudy silks or fine attire, but the simple habit of an abbess. She wore no gems, save the ring which Gazdor had given her, which remained on her left ring finger. Still, such was her beauty that the simple, pious garb was all that was required. The elven men and women alike came, dressed in white no more. For among the elves, white is the color of death, and green is the color of life. As such, each one came in verdant clothing, robes for the men and dresses for the women, so that wherever they went they flowed. Andri caused a minor stir when she entered with an elf maiden on her arm, dressed still in white but highlighted in green. Some began to wonder at her companion, but it was merely written off as one of the elves' stranger customs. The dragonborn came in the most unusual and unexpected garb. They were each clad in the skins of wild beasts, decorated with horns, teeth and fangs. This was because of ancient tradition, for such had been their garb when they were still nomads. The exceptions to this were pieces of very old jewelry, clearly of dwarven make, most works of gold inlaid with pearls Farron came at their head in all the savage glory of a tribal chief, adorned with all the most dangerous creatures of land and sea, and on his head a crown of gold in which seven pearls of magnificent size and beauty were set. As for the hobgoblins, they dressed as they had been accustomed to in the days of their mighty empires. Each came clad in a white toga which they wrapped about themselves. Officers were entitled to wear a stripe of red upon theirs, and centurions a slash of purple. Eort on the other hand came in a toga entirely of purple, with his face painted red like a deity's. He looked the very picture of one of the ancient triumphators. The halflings came in simple clothes, yet each of fine quality. These Sunday bests had been maintained, inherited, and slightly altered over the course of many generations. As such, though the halfling maid might only come clad in a simple blue dress, for them each carried history and artistry the equal of any gem. Peregrine came in a simple black tunic with the emblem of his god upon it. Kazdor had offered him gems and panoply worthy of a prince, but the halfling contented to wear his chef's hat, for this was to his people the greatest and most worthy crown. The kobolds also came in simple, practical clothing, for they were a pragmatic race with little time for overly fanciful dress. That being said, they did attend to themselves to make themselves as presentable and grand as they were able. The women wore beautiful shells and carefully carved wooden images upon long necklaces and bracelets, whereas the men decorated their scales with red and green dyes in swirling, fantastic patterns. Each one had thoroughly scrubbed and burnished the bands of platinum scale about their heads, so that the Silver Crown's tribe showed their name rightly. In a similar manner, the goblins did not attend over much to their garb, but instead each one was themselves decorated with makeup and dyes. They also came wearing many pieces of jewelry, most of it carved from bone, and upon them were remarkable works of scrimshaw. As for the humans, Theirs was a riotous spectacle of all the varying forms of fashion and sort that come from the many human cultures and taking pieces from every other style also. A whirling mess of colors that each one seemed rather different. Julian himself wore a simple, aged set composed of black pants and jacket, 
with a white undershirt. He wore a poppy above his breast in what he called a carazon, and the manner of his dress he called tuxedo, and it seemed an alien yet appealing style, clearly from Sigil or perhaps an even more distant plane. Then, when all were assembled once more, there was again much feasting and celebration. The feasting went on for several hours, and all the bounty of land and sea alike was devoured, along with what alcohol was available. After this, they rested for a little while, and Farron stood. And, with occasional correction from the rest of the paladins, he told the full tale of the paladins, from their coming from the land until now. His knowledge was incomplete, and with it the tale, but for an amateur he did a well enough job, if the written version of his speech is accurate. I would provide it again here, but that would take too many pages to tell again what is already told. Then, the tables were cleared and parted, and the dining hall became a ballroom, and there was much dancing and celebration. Cause Dora and Senkit whirled in the walls, moving as one flesh. If this were a story of the world as it should be, I think that I would have liked to end it here, in triumph and resolve. But this is the world as it is, and though man's heart shall never be satisfied with it, I am bound to tell the tale truthfully. And Julian, while not a son of Adam, was a son of a daughter of Eve, and so in him burned also the memory of the world that was. He turned his gaze from the happily imperfect scene and looked out towards the great stone they had set up, and the crimson path that yet lay before him. He gazed towards St. Jonah's, towards the waiting blight, and the flames of his dream consumed him. I am the bard, who has seen the unfortunate reality that the story of life does not end on simple notes of conclusion after climax, and more often than not to its sorrow. The festivities of the victory celebration came to an end after many long hours of partying, dancing, eating, drinking, and general merriment. Most went off to their chambers and rested there, but not all. Julian remained, perched on the lip of his balcony, staring out into the dark. He could not pierce the shadow, though his vision was still keen as an eagle, even if a one-eyed falcon now. But even had he lost both his eyes in the struggle, he could still see that which he gazed upon. San Jonas, the ruined city, called to him, and the call had sunk itself into his soul like meat hooks into a slab of pork. Like a siren it had a hold of him, and he should never be released from it. For it was not merely the city he desired, but its gateway, its path. Should he take a hold of it? It would be the dawn and rising of a new age, his age. By it he could unify the land and tame it. There would be the great university, his bold new system of governance, his empire of many people. But for all that he would need the city. Yet even still, he looked towards it with a mix of bitterness and longing, for he also looked down to the great stone he had set up, and the crimson path that stained the beaches of memory. Ye can I rest, in spite of all the celebrations. He heard a familiar voice from behind as Kazdor approached. I'm afraid not old friend. Julian said, with the sort of tiredness of the soul that one normally only finds in the elderly. Much as I would like to. I, it said kings na sleep, and I feel the same. Kazdor said as he joined his friend on the balcony, casting a gaze into the east where the city waited. And though ye mean take all yourself something else, ye would be king over this union of yours. Julian smiled sheepishly. Is it really that obvious? I, ne matter how hard ye try ye are nakedly ambitious, and have been since we first met. Cause Dor said with a chuckle. I still recall the look in your eye when we took the abbey, when ye thought to yourself now I have a castle of force and took it off ye. But you still agreed to the constitution, and you aren't pitching me off this volcano for trying. I, mostly because despite the fact ye're a bastard, ye'd be a good king. Ye're clever enough for it, and crazy enough to be brilliant when ye can pull your head out of your ass. Julian snorted, but cause door continued, and the look of mirth fell from Julian's face. And ye care for your people. 
else she'd need be waiting up here tormented by the stone and the price she can you'll have to pay for that city. Julian returned his gaze to the beach, Anka's door laid a hand on his shoulder, a shoulder which bore the weight of unfathomable guilt and responsibility. For all ye like to play at being the perfect ruthless prince, ye are still a good man just. Lie to me, to the rest, and to yourself all ye like, the truth outs when I see ye crushed by the death so those ye can I protect. Could not, or would not? Julian said bitterly. Ye gave your life on an eye laddie, what more remains save your soul? And should I not have given that also? I am damned already. I may as well make some profit out of it. Perhaps had I given it then, when we first faced the late tomb, then it should never have come to this, and those who perished would not have had to been sacrificed. But no, I was a coward, and others pay the price for it. A coward? Nee, merely holding on to some wee last bit o' wisdom, even in the hour o' your desperation. Ye can nee be expected to give that, as it's nee yours to give away. The nine hells with it, it is. Julian snarled. And the nine it isn't my responsibility. Maybe it shouldn't be but I am here and the gods are not, so I shall cover and do what I must. Such you know, I have said it from the start. I am the crimson path, and my blood should have been the only spilt for this, rather than giving up so many others in sacrifice. At this Kazdor's face turned fell, and his scales gleamed with wrathful fire. Losing control of his temper, he clenched his fist and smashed the Arsimmer in the face. Julian went sprawling but came up on his feet, empty socket alight with crimson doom. Julian, you are... what? A heretic? A blasphemer? You knew this all damn well and you did nothing because you know I'm also right. Julian shouted back. Unbelievably arrogant, and that is why I hit you. You talk so much about how you revile the gods and you make a god of yourself. You did not sacrifice us, we all chose our sacrifice. Cause Dor snarled back, so furious that he lost control of his tongue and spoke in Draconic. We chose to fight and to die, not you. The eleven who died on your table chose to risk their lives. Andri chose to risk her life, not you. Now get this through your thick head before I hit you again. We knew the risks and we chose to take them, you didn't choose for us, so enough with your self-pity for thinking you sacrificed anyone. You are neither God nor Mind Flayer. They all chose that death for themselves, and willingly. They shouldn't have had to make that choice. Julian. For someone so learned you are remarkably foolish. Yes, they shouldn't have. Elatum should have never existed, this blight should have never come upon this land. This is the world as it is, and not even you can fix that. Not even the gods seem to be able to, and much as you like to pretend, you aren't better than the gods. You set yourself up on an impossible pedestal and expect to bear all the evil of the world alone. I speak to you as one king to another, this is an impossibility. We might be stronger, mightier and perhaps wiser, but we are in the end only men. We have a duty to them, but the duty ends at our limits, and anything beyond that is folly to dream of. Would you seek to cleanse away all disease? All hunger and the suffering of children born still? You drastically underestimate the extent of my learning and that of my ambitions, dear Kazdor. Julian responded. Those things can be cleared away, but the light of science and learning. In the same man, it is possible to obliterate all the world's suffering. Maybe it is. I freely admit you are better learned than me, although that does nothing to increase your wisdom. However, such things will not come without sacrifice and even you cannot possibly consider yourself so highly to think you were sufficient for that. Kazdor responded, and Julian gave him the look of a sheepish devil. Unbelievable. He grumbled in Dwarvish, pinching the space between his eyes where the bridge of his nose might have been had he had won. He shook his head back and forth, his wrath dissipating under a cooling wave of sheer incredulity. 
No wonder you are so distraught. You are entirely deluded and now the delusion has ended, and you are faced with the harshness of reality. You have placed yourself above man and expect to have none of his flaws. I should think that if you were not a paladin you and I would wind up killing each other, because you would have been an unspeakable tyrant and I would be obliged to destroy you. You would be obliged to try. Julian responded, but permitted his friend to continue. My point stands just. We all chose our own path and our own destiny. You are not responsible for us and try to take that responsibility from me again and I will hit you again to take you down a peg. Going for my newly acquired blind spot though, low blow. Julian responded, the light dimming from his empty socket as he rubbed the side of his face. So what then, are you telling me to continue or to remain where I am, you have given a great deal of criticism and very little advice. You swore an oath Julian and I mean both to hold you to it and aid you however I can in achieving it. After all, you are my friend, and I would dearly like to see the city you so proclaimed. We will still need the army then, and more training and planning, and then perhaps a decade of work afterwards, if not longer. Go and ask them then, Lord Commander. Kazdor responded. Your love for your people has gone as unnoticed as your ambition. Ouch. It's truly that obvious. To the point that any random fellow reading it on a town post board could tell you mean to make of yourself a king by another name, and set up a manner by which your successor will be a man very much like you. However, you are quite frankly the only person crazy enough to pull it off. And if I start going batty, er, uh, battier, I presume I can rely on you to come and beat some sense into me. Always because I'm going to outlive you. Our Simmer live nearly twice as long as men, and you might be a dwarf in mind, but your flesh will not avail you as long as it ought. With as much stress and worry as that office you desire shall place on you, you won't live half as long. Now go and rest, you shall have a speech to give on the morrow. Julian nodded, and the two men clasped one another's forearms in a gesture of mutual reconciliation and brotherhood, and then the Arsimer took his leave. The next day, Julian aroused and made himself ready for the day. The bruise from Kazdor's punch had been remedied with a light touch of healing magic. You know Bast, I can't help but wonder if the fact we can all put ourselves back together from a burned marshmallow improves our conversation or diminishes it. It certainly makes conversations more violent, but also a good deal more straightforward. The devil responded as she reclined on Julian's bed in her humanoid form, calmly flipping through the pages of yet another old book Julian had found in a dusty old dwarven library. By the way, I can't help but notice you decided to attend the ball alone. What of it? I was going to ask Andre, but then I found she'd already asked that maid of hers, what was her name again? Julian responded. Bast chuckled slightly at the memory of Julian's flabbergasted face at that news. Unimportant. The devil answered after a moment. She's a one-off side character really. All the world's a stage. Or so the bard says, but that doesn't mean you can just call people extras. Julian snorted at the joke. What then is a lemur? A good way of eating projectiles or blunting a judge. HMPH. Rocks work for that too, but they have less of a smell. There are more sinners than there are rocks. Touche, in Avenus particularly. But back on topic, I don't see why you ask. You've never taken much of an interest in my social life, or lack thereof before. Because I wanted to go, obviously, and having a cat run around the high table would have been embarrassing. You do know I can pass for a tabaxi perfectly well. Yes, and you know we have no tabaxi in this colony, so people will question, or worse assume I quite literally summoned my date. Hair Rumpf. Once you become emperor, Please do import some so that I can quit using that cat disguise. Lord Commander. Julian corrected the devil as he snapped on his cloak and checked its hem. 
My ambition isn't quite that naked, I at least bothered to give it some boxes. Well, whatever you call yourself main f- Oh, come now, I'm crazy but not that stupid, I know enough strategy to know you don't fight a war on two fronts, or invade Russia period. Very well then Nil Principi, do put on your mask before you go though, I should hope all those hours you kept me up practicing in your mirror will pay off. They have every time before dear Bast, and now I must depart. Julian said, adjusting the gilded he patch cause door had given him during the feast, then stepping out his door. Bast shut it behind him and returned promptly to her book. Julian descended until he had come to the dining hall, where all had once again assembled. He waited until all had settled, and rose, striking a great gong so as to announce that he had a great deal to say. The ding quieted, and they turned their eyes to Julian. My friends, my countrymen, my beloved Union, we have indeed won a great victory. At this there were many cheers. We have driven back a foe who would have destroyed us, although with great sacrifice. We have established ourselves in a strong fortress, not merely once but twice over, as now we may return in peace to the Abbey. However, this victory is not yet complete. You have heard of the deadly blight that afflicts all lands not under the will of civilization no doubt. Well, I know its source, and mean to strike at it. To the east lies the city of San Jonas, once the great capital of the northern garden, and the greatest city of the north, now but a ruin. It has become a den of gnolls and orcs. From here hail both our kobold brethren, and also my own brother in arms Yort. You can guess then, rightly, that I mean to retake this city, and to set it up for our capital. However, for that I must call upon your aid once more. I cannot in good conscience demand this of any of you, but I must, by oath and by dream, ask it of you. I would go and reach for it myself, but there are limits even to the miracles paladins may accomplish. At this his head fell slightly and he rubbed his shoulder where Elaton's halberd had killed him. I have given all I have. My will, my mind, my strength, my body, my very life. In spite of this, it is not sufficient to bring this to a close, even in undeath I would strive, but it is not enough. As such, I must turn to you and ask sacrifice of you also. I cannot promise a bloodless and glorious campaign. Nay, our enemy is too savage and wicked for it to be anything but an equally deadly contest. Should we win, we will wipe out the last great threats to our union, and gain a ruin for our toil. It shall take easily 10, perhaps 15 years before it shall be restored. So that is what I can offer, only blood and toil. But not without reason, lest you all think I have taken leave of my senses. Think on this. We have attained for ourselves two mighty bastions, but they are small. Shall we remain in this fortress until it is bursting to capacity? Shall the abbey overflow with people? We may yet farm. But so long as this heart of blight remains our land shall be but a sliver of what might be attained. What of the gnolls and orcs? They will not be idle forever. Nay, they shall come again, and the destruction must be answered with sacrifice, over and over again. But I say to you this need not be our fate. Come, let us give up of ourselves this one last time. Let us push on to this total and absolute victory. Let us drive the blight from our lands, shatter the hordes of the savages, and claim the whole of this northern garden as an inheritance for all our children, a land of eternal summer overflowing with bounty. And then, I shall fulfill to you the oath I swore at the hills of San Jonas all those long days ago. I will return, and I shall cleanse this city. I shall not suffer the beast, nor the fanatic, nor the blight. It shall be restored. With great stones I shall clad her walls, and with the mightiest defenses she shall be protected. She shall have such craftsmanship, magic, 
and technology that no city can match her in glory. She will be my bulwark against chaos. She will be my defender of civilization. Her glory shall reach the outer stars, and my citizens shall know no fear. The crowd had grown more and more excited over the course of the speech, and as it fell away, one of the soldiers rose, pumped his fist into the air, and declared, Order Valt! Order Valt! Order Valt! The cry was picked up throughout the hall until all the hold rang with the declaration and the call to this last crusade. Order Valt! Order Valt! Order Valt! Well guys, hope you enjoy today's video. We are going to assume you have if you have stayed to the end. Consider subscribing and clicking the notification bell if you really enjoyed it to stay up to speed with any and all new videos. Also check out the links below to our shop for some fat ass titties and our sponsor Rural and be sure to use a promo code at checkout so they know we sent you and you'll get 10% off. And until next time.